So I'm here in New York City, and uh, I'm sitting here with Adam Neely, who all of you know. And I called Adam about an hour ago, and I said, what are you doing? And he says, uh, I'm working on video. Oh, great. Well, come over to the power station. He say, said, are you in New York? I said, yeah. I said, well, come over to the power station. We'll make a video. Uh, what are okay. we talking about today? What are we talking about? I, I said, no I have idea. no idea. I said, what time are you be here? He said, I can be there by 1230. That's about 1240 now. So Adam poured himself some coffee, as I did. And we are gonna. And we have no idea what we're going to talk about. Although we talked for, for about two minutes out there. And I was like, we'll just wait and, and talk about it here. But I always enjoy my conversations with Adam, who I always will credit as the first person to shout out my channel at the very beginning. And it gave me the Neely boost, which I always will refer to it as. <laughs> and I always enjoy having conversations with Adam. The last time we did a video together was actually here, yep. but it was with the fake background of this exact studio. We're actually in the studio now, which I'm very <laughs> excited. We've upgraded. <laughs> so I've, I've only been in the studio, I think, one time before. Have you ever been in this, room, in this particular room? I have. I shot something with uh, Grace Kelly, who's this awesome saxophone player. Um, but this is my second time here. This is a, it's a nice room. Beautiful Love room. Yeah. This is Studio A at, uh, or Studio One. Studio A, I think. A. Studio A at uh, the power station, which used to be Avatar. When I was here in 99, Last time I was here, it was Avatar. Yeah, yeah. Berkeley now uh, owns owns it, and um, Adam, welcome. Well, thanks for having me on the show. That was a long, long rambling <laughs> introduction. Yeah. So I was talking to Adam about an interview that a friend, Ted Joya, wrote about pop stardom, popular um, culture relevance, or stardom lasts about eighty years. This is a, a, a something that he wrote about recently in one of his sub stacks and I was telling Adam that I just assume that people don't know anything if you refer to any musician of the past that's not that's maybe from 30 years ago or beyond that they just don't know who they are a musician a producer whoever and I thought it was an interesting topic to talk about yeah I mean uh, I think Ted was talking about the 80 years threshold which I think is you know that's how long a human being lasts you know <laughs> And I think there might be something to that, that uh, it takes 80 years for somebody to uh, pass out of the public consciousness. And you're talking just earlier about Bob Hope. <laughs> right. Who, who I actually have no idea how I know of Bob Hope. Because he's kind of before your time. He's a, the biggest comedian of the 20th century. Yeah. And I honestly have no, I don't know any of his routines because I know he was a comedian. I don't know any television programs, radio shows. All I know is that he was popular uh, like in USO shows during yes. World War II. That's literally the only subject, like the only tidbit of information that I know about Bob Hope. And he was the most popular like entertainer in America for a long, long yeah, time. Really yeah, really of the, the most popular comedian of the 20th century yeah. in the United States and had an airport named after him. This was the thing that, that Ted brings up. The airport, airport in Burbank was renamed because nobody knows who Bob Hope is anymore. And he died in 2003. Adam said, rightfully, he said, I think he lived a long time. He lived to be 100. 100 years old. Right to the, right to the year, which and is amazing. There are other people who were incredibly influential that we remember but certain other people like Bob Hope, for whatever reason, I think the internet term is their memory hold. They uh, go away from our collective consciousness. And it's interesting, like why? Why does that happen? Why, does, why is Bob Hope not as remembered, but like, I don't know, uh, Beethoven or Bach or you know these other great figures from history? Why are they Okay, what's your, what, what, is your, what is your theory about this? Wait, I want to yeah, bring yeah, up one yeah. other person that they put. They had yeah, Benny yeah. Goodman was another oh, musician yeah, yeah. that was referenced in the article. And I, I think Benny Goodman, though, is at least in jazz school, I think school and like uh, university education, we have like these people that are held up as like the great figures of the canon. You know, every jazz musician is going to know Miles Davis and Charlie Parker and John Coltrane, maybe le to a lesser extent, Benny Goodman, because he's not quite in that same lineage, I guess. Yeah. He doesn't have quite that uh, impact, but he was st he's still an important figure in the great lineage of jazz music. And so because of that, certain figures are taught in schools and certain figures like continue on in the memory. Uh, I did not learn about Bob Hope in jazz school. So, 
<laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. So what about popular culture figures, though? What are your theories on this? Why do people know Beethoven or Bach? Why do they... I, I would say most people will know those names. And they, they may not know who Miles Davis was, but they mm-hmm. could tell you who Bach and Beethoven were, who were hundreds of years, you know, died hundreds of years ago. Well, I think there's, especially with Bach and Beethoven, there's like a long tradition of also keeping that up. So, I mean, hopefully in a hundred years, Miles Davis will be part of that, like, you know, long tradition and long, like, history, important historical figures. But I think uh, education is a big part of it. Like, um, there, there's a, a concerted effort to keep the memory alive through, like, concerts, for example. Mm-hmm. That's a big thing, too. Um, it's hard to do, like, Bob Hope concerts after he passed right and i think music is one of those things where it's easier to keep a tradition alive because you can keep playing the music you know um in a way that you couldn't do with like um you know charlie chaplin's uh, another figure from the early 20th century that more people probably know uh, uh, than bob hope because more people i think watches movies more regularly mm-hmm. and there is also the uh the tradition of saying like, oh, this is like an important figure of movie history, Charlie Chaplin. Um, I mean, people I my know. age, everyone my age knows Bob Hope. Yeah. If you're over 60, you know Bob Hope because your parents loved Bob Hope or whatever. He was on TV all the time. He, not only was he a film star and a, and a comedian, but he was on The Tonight Show all the time. Yeah, was, yeah. You know. Uh, I, I don't know. I, like, I don't know. Maybe it's also the uh, the impact, like, you know, people talking about Bob Hope. Do comedians these days talk about Bob nope. Hope's impact? They talk about like, you know, George Carlin, Richard Pryor. Very few people are gonna be talking about Bob Hope. And I think that's- Will it, they talk about Richard Pryor and George Carlin in 40 years? I, I don't know, maybe. And it's interesting to see because we have no no concept. I'm not sure if there's a, a formula for well, well let's, <laughs> for let's, yeah. let's talk about music <laughs> yeah, yeah. This oh is, yeah we're, we're musicians let's talk about, <laughs> we'll talk about musical figures yeah so i have a theory that bach and beethoven mozart whose music still gets played regularly at concert halls on recordings there are no definitive recordings of them you can't put on a bach record you mm. can't put on a beethoven record mm. but you can put on a beatles record or you can put on a miles davis record so there are definitive things i i was listening to ESP the other day, Miles Davis record. You can always refer back to these things. So you can bring up videos on YouTube of Miles playing. You can't bring up a video of Bach playing. Mm. Does their music being preserved through notation and through people performing it over centuries, is that one of the reasons why it's known by more people? I think so. I think that notation, they're two different traditions, right? There's the oral tradition, which is literally the oral a-u-r-a-l but also o-r-a-l why is it that why do they have the same sound <laughs> ah, adam it's, english I always, I always have to I always have to say that too <laughs> well there, yeah there's the tradition of recordings which yep. is important and then there's the tradition of uh sheet music and what's interesting is as technology i feel like got better recorded technology got better in like the 1940s 50s 60s we now have a more preserved record so, you know, the Beatles and Elvis and, uh, you know, Chuck Berry or any of these great figures from the 1950s and 60s, they're more part of the canon now because the fidelity of the recordings is higher. In the 1930s, 1940s, the fidelity of the recordings wasn't quite as good. And right. so the, it's not as ever present in our current culture. Although there's, this is something that's very interesting. Uh, do you know Darcy James Argue? He's a fantastic, like, big band composer and educator. Don't know him. No. He teaches, uh, I believe, at Manhattan School of Music. Okay. And he was talking about how ten years ago musicians were uh, had more of a problem with the low f- fidelity of like old 1920s, 1930s recordings. Like students just couldn't quite get past that grittiness of it all. Yeah. But now, because everybody's listening to recordings on their phone, they don't mind the grittiness of 1920s or 1930s recordings, and so they can like engage with it a little bit more. So what I think is going to happen, because everybody is more accustomed to the crappier quality, honestly, from the phones, <laughs> is that people can engage with uh, Louis Armstrong recordings uh, from the 1920s that previously it was just a little bit more difficult to get into because the recording quality was 
so crappy. <laughs> when I uh, I just released a Keith Jarrett interview. Oh my god, it's so good. Thank oh, you. A that, couple of, oh, that, yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, Pat, well, Pat Matheny in the beginning of it talks yeah. about, and this is from my interview that I did here in this building uh, uh, last year, and Pat talks about Keith's American Quartet and European Quartet. But Keith is one of the, he said, the last important composer. His body of work of songs. He talks about how people don't play the music, though, because it's too hard. And Keith probably doesn't want them to play it because it probably wouldn't be as good. And, and it, it was just a very yeah. funny, funny thing about it. But he really reveres Keith. And that people don't go back necessarily and play. They do play certain people's music. Charlie yeah. Parker is a person whose music and Miles Davis and John Coltrane, they're three jazz musicians whose music has been played and still is played. These are what we call jazz standards. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I mean, I'm not and sure. Is that, and is that, the, is that similar to Bach and Beethoven and Mozart, that their music keeps getting played just like people play confirmation or they play ornithology or they play moments notice or giant steps? I think there, I mean, there's many reasons. I think that people see something beautiful in the music and that's why they want to play it over and over again. And because we have the sheet music, we can play it over and over again, which is great. Mm -hmm. I think also there's pedagogical reasons why we might play certain things, like Charlie Parker's music is good for teaching bebop. Yep. And bebop is, you can teach it in schools, so we teach Charlie Parker's music. It might be a little bit more difficult to teach the music of Keith Jarrett, for example. Absolutely true. Yeah, yes. yeah. And I mean, there's great, there's great music out there that's hard to teach. And I think that because of that, it's less likely to continue in the university system. Um, the Beatles is easy to teach in school, for yes. example. Like this is, this is something that you'll see all over the place. If you go to music school, chances are your music theory teacher is inserting the Beatles somewhere as like right. the cute hip thing to do. <laughs> but they're not uh, inserting the kinks, for example, because it's not as an important part of like that music theory tradition. I think that the way that we uh, keep music alive has much, much more to do with what we see, like what the value we see in playing it over and over again. And I think for a lot of people, box music is great and beautiful, but you can also teach it to other people. The music of Bach or mm -hmm. the music of that time period is, is really when the, the norms of, of harmony and tonal music were, were established and able to be taught, you know, where it's differentiated from the Renaissance era, from modal music. A lot goes back, I always talk about this in my videos because it's just a fun word. <laughs> It's the meme meme word. Uh, Johann Fuchs, yeah. uh, Gratis ad pernasum, yep. uh, counterpoint te <laughs> textbook. 1725, he was codifying the music of Palestrina. And then right. after uh, all that was codified in 1725, uh, basically every common practice musician, classical musician, studied out of this one textbook. That's, right. That's how we get the music to this day, is that at some point it was all codified. I'm not sure if the comedy of Bob Hope will ever be codified <laughs> in a t uh, textbook, uh, but I don't know, maybe it will. <laughs> okay, so Adam, I want to ask you this. So you and I have big YouTube channels. I mean, that's not stating uh, anything that's, that's uh, controversial. We're both jazz musicians too. Well, we're jazz musicians that also are interested in popular culture and pop music. Now, I have a background in rock music and things like that, and I work as a producer, so this has also been part of my thing. Yeah. What about being a jazz musician? And I love Adam's channel. If you don't know Adam's channel, I always assume everybody knows <laughs> Adam Neely, and if you don't subscribe to Adam's channel, go click on it. You can click on any video of Adam's because they're all incredibly interesting and incredibly well done and thought out. Why are your videos, why are you successful in this? Um, and does it have to know. do with being a jazz musician? Well, I, uh, the relationship to jazz. Jazz is cool. Okay. Jazz is awesome. There's so much stuff to I talk agree. about. <laughs> uh, you know, but I... But you make videos on, on all different things. You make videos on popular culture. Yeah. You don't I, just make jazz videos. I think, you know, uh, jazz music is deep. There's a, like a long connection to American culture. 
and you know popular culture um especially from american popular culture is related in so many oblique ways to jazz i just i love it i don't know i think youtube is a platform where if you're passionate about what it is that you do uh you're going to find some success and you know i was i've been making youtube videos for 16 years now mm -hmm. um I are almost 17, actually. Oh, and by the I'm way, I'm going to inter intersperse here. If you haven't seen Adam's video he did a few years ago about when he had been making them for 14 years, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is one of my favorite videos yeah. of his because he shows old clips in it, and and it's it's a great video. Well, thank you, man. I've, I've been on this platform for the almost the majority of my life, which is just insane to think about. Um, I've been making videos and sharing the things that I'm excited about with people for a very long time. And jazz has been at the core of that because you know that's the, that's the music that I play, that's the music and culture and vocabulary that I speak. Uh, but you know, I, I have a wide interest in a, like a lot of different things. Music production in addition to, to popular music because you, you use a lot of, <clears throat> yeah. you just had your video where you show Melodyne and how to use it. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, uh, <clears throat> that's a fun one. Like so I did a video where I uh, stripped out the uh, like instrumentals from like Led Zeppelin and uh, Frank Sinatra and then retuned uh, the vocals to see like how Melodyne well, would change. <laughs> well, and, and you did the thing with vibrato. Oh yeah, yeah. That was that's that was the one fun. I was talking about. The uh, vibrato. One. Oh yeah. That What's was... it sound like without vibrato? Because you can with Melodyne, which is a plug-in. Just for those of you that don't know. But I mean, the, the point was that yeah. that you use modern production tools and techniques that are really associated with making the making of popular music. I don't think of jazz musicians and Melodyne, even though they probably have jazz uh, musicians oh, that use Melodyne. Oh my gosh, of times. they do. Yeah, with yeah. pitch correction. Yeah, that's a huge thing. Yeah. Um, is that actually? Because I don't, I don't know about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you change any, I've seen it done before, just yeah. changing and chopping up things. I mean, I personally like the sound of a band in a room. And the, the older I get, I'm 34. I'm not, <laughs> not, uh, not, not young, but not old. Um, though, yeah, I mean, I like the sound of a band in a room, and you can't do Melodyne to the sound of a band no. in a room. Although, although. With AI stem separation. Yeah, and, and you did the AI thing where you, you <laughs> did the shout out to the company. What is it, Adam? Uh, Laolao.ai. <laughs> I'm not sponsored by them. I just think it's a cool technique. You can do pitch correction to the sound of a vocal in a, uh, a camera recording. Yeah. Meaning, like, if you have cell phone audio, you can strip out <clears throat> the uh, sound of the voice from the rest of the audio. And you can tune anything in there. It's actually kind of amazing what you can do now with the, that technology. I don't know where the thread of this conversation is. Well, go back to why. Yeah. I want to know why, why being a jazz, we're both oh, jazz yeah. musicians. Yep. Why does that help? Does that help us? I don't know. I think it's a perspective that's not common in popular culture. And mm -hmm. so people are interested, especially with people who are interested with, you know, you have a huge background in jazz and popular culture, popular music. People are interested to see what somebody with that background can communicate through YouTube. We we're talking about like stuff that's forgotten. A big thing here is magazines are not common anymore. Print media has gone the way of the dinosaurs. And so YouTube becomes a way of people getting culture, like engaging with culture. And I think jazz is an important part of the culture. And the fact that we have that background, I think, I don't know. It makes it people are interested. I don't think, I mean, any kind of narrative where jazz is not popular culture is not true, I think. Mm -hmm. And having some kind of tie to that, that big body of work, all the great musicians, all the great music uh, on YouTube, I think is important. I think people respond to that too, which is why, you know, we have the channels that we do. I'm going to still stay on this for a second. Okay. Okay. So I don't know. I don't know. Do you think answer, that, yeah. that because of the, the pedagogy that you go through, just being a jazz listener, mm. being a really critical listener, you listen to how phrases are put together. Mm -hmm. You listen to how they relate to chord progressions. Yep. There's so many different things with you're dealing with improvisation on multiple instruments at the same time. Yeah. Does that make you a better video maker? Does it make you able to tell a story just, you know, in a different way than somebody that doesn't have that background? I think so. 
I think of video editing like I talk about this all the time. I think of video editing kind of like music. There's this one recording, I, I never shut up about this, but Mingus at Antibes is a great recording, great live recording by Charles Mingus. And there's one tune called Wednesday Night Prayer Meeting mm -hmm. on there. It's one of my favorite recordings, just classic Charles Mingus. Uh, it's chaotic, there's lots of improvisation going everywhere, but it's very tightly structured, meaning every section in this particular recording is like, it, it goes from one time feel to the next time feel in this very, very linear way. And every time he switches, it feels like inevitable almost. It feels like this is the right moment to switch. It's all chaos and all of a sudden everything comes crashing down into one downbeat. It's great. And I try and organize YouTube videos in a similar way because for about 14 minutes on this recording of Wednesday night prayer meeting, Charles Mingus keeps you at the edge of your seat, it keeps you engaged, it keeps you feeling this amazing feeling. And I try to edit YouTube videos in kind of a similar way where I'm organizing it so it feels logical, it feels engaging, and I try and keep my edits musical, I guess, if that makes any sense. So, so do you yeah. think of your intro as playing the head the first time, yeah. then, you're, then you play the head at the end again? <laughs> yeah, I mean, kind of, yeah. For like... those of you that don't know what the head is, it's not the bathroom. Ah, well, ooh. it could be. Yeah. But it's the, uh, <laughs> it's the melody of a song. <laughs> Jazz players, we always, you know, let's take, a, you know, we'll go back to the head after the drum solo or whatever. That yeah. means go back to the melody. Yeah, and you organize an improvisation in jazz very, like there's a strong formal plan. You understand, okay, we improvise after we play the melody and then this next person takes the solo and they keep repeating the form. And then when you study jazz music, you have a keen understanding of form in addition to you know melody and harmony and rhythm. And I think all of those things go into YouTube videos. I don't want to say that it's the same because it is different, but I will say that my study of jazz like has made me appreciate uh, what cinematographers do and like what people who make films do because I can see my own craft reflected in that and that's pretty cool. Okay, so, so we're gonna take yeah. it. We're gonna do a riff off this. this okay. Thing. Okay. Jazz equals YouTube. <laughs> so so when you first learned about A A B A forms yeah, and improvising yeah. with this, so A A B A. So you play that. You have an A melody that you repeat. Let's mm -hmm. say it's eight bars, and you have another eight bars. Then you have a bridge, the B section. Then you come back to the A section. So. This is confusing to some people. A A B A A A B A A A B A. So when you're improvising over this, if you're playing rhythm changes, which is the tune I got rhythm by George Gershwin, mm -hmm. chord progression. Some people, when I have to explain that it's A A B A A A B A, so, uh, that it kind of warps my mind. I don't know. I just naturally understood that pattern. Mm. Yet mm. some people just can't wrap their head around that there's two A's, a B, and an A, and then another two A's, a B, and an A, and then that. What do you think about that? Do you think some people just naturally understand phrases without being told? Well, I think it's, you know, it's in the air. Um, people naturally understand verse, chorus, verse, chorus format in pop music because mm -hmm. that's everything. That's, yeah. that's the format. And AABA is a much older style. It yeah. comes from the popular song of like Broadway. Although what's very interesting is that the original songs, A-A-B-A, -A, that was only repeated maybe twice mm -hmm. because there was like uh, in the original forms of I Got Rhythm, for example, there's like, uh, or maybe Someone to Watch Over Me or like mm -hmm. these classic tunes. There's a verse. There's a thing that is like this free composed verse that starts up the tune and then the band kicks in and then the singer sings the A-A-B-A -A -A form. Then there might be a modulation that repeats and then it's done. But then jazz musicians just have A, A, B, A, and it just repeats constantly over and over again, which is interesting because what happens sometimes is you get lost in the form, especially if you're a, a young musician, you say like- And the drummer's taking a solo and-, and Oh my they... gosh. <laughs> because they yeah. They play too many things over the bar line, you don't know where you are. Too many metric modulations, man. <laughs> too many metric modulations. It's a form that you kind of, have, you can intuit better if you grew up with the music or if you studied it or if it's been part of the air around you. Otherwise, it's harder to, to know that that's what's going on. You know? So if you look back at a, at a song, I, you know, one of the 
probably most blade standards, all the things you are, that's kind of an A, B, A form. It's, it's, so it's A, the second A is in a different key, right? You start in A flat. The second A is in E flat. And then you have a bridge. And then you come back to an A, but then it has a coda, basically. There's four, there's four extra bars. Yeah. Yeah. That's A, A prime, B, A double prime. <laughs> right, right. So that's, but that kind of follows a form. And Stella yeah. by Starlight doesn't really, is not really an A, A, B, A form. It's, uh, it has a bridge. It has the out chorus that, that does, you know, 2-5 in D minor, 2-5 in, in C minor, 2-5 in B flat minor. But it's, yeah. but it's a, it, that's not an A, B. So a lot, I mean, a lot of jazz standards are not A, B, A forms, mm -hmm. but the ones that jazz musicians like to improvise over, or write melodies over, and I think it's related to Charlie Parker tunes, because those are ones, most of those were A, A, B, A forms. Well, the, you know, the reason why they're A, B, A. Although Charlie Parker, All yeah. the Things You Are, is one of the most famous ones. Uh, well, the reason why Charlie Parker tunes are A, A, B, A is because he was writing contrafacts on top of a classic like Broadway standards, yeah. like uh, Donnelly is uh, Indiana. Back home in Indiana. Back, back home in Indiana. Indiana. Yep. Um, and so like- uh, And he did this so he wouldn't have to pay royalties. He rewrote a new melody so that he wouldn't have to pay the composers because he was just borrowing the chord progression to improvise over. Yeah, and because he was doing that, that there's now the AABA is now like solidified as part of the jazz <laughs> canon, like the thing that we, you know, we uh, we we do and like because it's now part of the history, yeah. which is which is fun to like look back on. And now people like in order to imitate the style, they'll write A A B A tunes. Yep. You know, I just did a video about video game music and how, yes. how video game uh, music often is following these forms of A A B A or A B A C. And originally it was because they just needed things to repeat over and over again. But it just so happened that jazz musicians have this long tradition of dealing with these kinds of forms. So now video game tunes, they're simple little melodies. They work perfectly for like jazz jam sessions and for jazz improvisation. Um, you know, today is March 10th. It's Mario day. Just wow. a, a March M-A-R-10 <laughs> Mario. Fun fact. Um, but that's kind of a fun thing about how the form from like early in the 20th century now is like finding a new kind of home because of that. So this is yeah. actually breaking the 80 year cycle then of popularity. Well, yeah. I mean, there's, I think there's ways out of the 80 year cycle and I think you have to find a continuation. You have to find some kind of way of taking the old tradition and marrying it to a new practice. And Bob Hope, not to bring this all around back to Bob Hope, but he, he doesn't. I Maybe we need Bob yeah. Hope memes if there was a Bob Hope meme, because many <laughs> Come famous- Come on, guys, get on, get get on Reddit. On, make get some on Bob Reddit, Hope make some Bob Hope memes. <laughs> uh, memes uh, have, have, have found, their, have found yeah. a way to make certain artists' careers over again. Yeah, for sure. Memes are a way of like continuing the culture in a way. And usually memes are visual. Um, I mean, there's exceptions to that, of course, like, I, I'm wearing <clears throat> the meme onto all memes right now, but normally memes are visual, and that's a way of connecting. And Actually, that's you. a visual meme. There, it is a visual. It's an meme. audio hey, meme. It's audio the lick. meme. But now it is a visual meme. Um, and do you sell those, Adam? <laughs> I do technically. <laughs> That was a my very lecture. subtle <laughs> very product subtle. Thank placement you. there, but go to Adam's. Uh, um, uh, I, think it, I think they're still technically on Teespring. Okay. It's so, not called Teespring anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I clearly don't sell these. Adam, that, that, was, that, was, that was the <laughs> most perfect product placement I've ever, I've ever seen. Uh, Integration. Uh, I appreciate very, it. Very well done. <laughs> Definitely buy Adam's Lick t-shirt there. Uh, or, or don't, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, the memes are a way of like continuing culture. Um, and the, the important thing with memes is like remixing. You want to figure out a way of taking a general idea and reinterpreting it. And that's, uh, you know, that's the way that so much uh, gets, you know, continues. Like I'm, I'm sure like, um, you know, Simpsons memes or like Arthur memes or, or these like shows from my childhood, these like animated shows from my childhood, they have, they're going to continue to have like a huge cultural impact because there are memes from these animated television programs that I'm sure Gen Z is not watching regularly. Gen Z is not watching The Simpsons regularly, but they probably engage with the culture because they've seen Simpsons memes. So, yeah. So I, 
was uh, talking with my kids the other day, and we realized that my youngest, Layla, who just turned 10 a couple of days ago, she's Gen Alpha. Okay, so I have two Gen Z kids and a Gen Alpha kid. Is that so what Gen, they're calling it? Wow. That's what they're calling it now, apparently. Wow, cool. And um, I had to look it up because I, I was like, I don't think that Layla's, I don't think she's Gen Z. So we looked it up and Gen Alpha, I think, is from 2010 on, maybe. Wow. So she was born in 2013. It's fascinating, though, what they know if I play songs. She, oh, I've heard that before. And, you know, th- wow. songs that are that you would never think that they would know, but they stumble on them on TikTok or on yep. YouTube Shorts. She watches YouTube Shorts mainly. Speaking of that, YouTube Shorts, TikTok, Instagram, those three short-form content platforms, mm-hmm. um, I find that musicians are still Instagram based. Yeah. Why? I don't know, but that's something that I've, I have seen. Yeah. Instagram is where musicians are. I've talked to a bunch of, um, and it hasn't changed really in in years. No. And I don't see it changing for the foreseeable yeah. future. I think the, a culture is a big part of it. Like Instagram, that's where musicians always were. And so they don't see any reason to switch over. I've talked to other creators who aren't musicians, and they look at Instagram like, what is Instagram? What the hell is this thing? <laughs> uh, I've talked to people who, like, you know, they're Gen Z people who are not musicians, and they, they don't, they're not on Instagram, right. but musicians are on Instagram. The musicians are on Instagram. And it's going strong. It is yeah. going strong. Like, Instagram still has an incredibly thriving community for musicians, and yeah. if you are a musician, you got to get on your Instagram game still. Which Even is, though some yeah. of my, my YouTuber friends, I won't name them, but a guitar player that lives in my, in my hometown in Atlanta, um, who says, who've been telling me for the last four years, oh, Instagram's over. Oh, Instagram's over. It's I'm like, not, man. I'm like, Rhett, Instagram's not over. <laughs> it's not, man. <laughs> Sorry, Rhett. This, this guitarist, Rhett, <laughs> is wrong. That we won't name. <laughs> He's literally been telling me for the last four years, why are you posting on Instagram? It's over. I'm like, what? Are you, what? Instagram's not over. Yeah, I mean, there's now so- he's posting on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it is. It's where a lot of people are still posting, engaging with stories and with content. Like it's it's still big, but yeah. it's interesting to see how the different platforms have segmented musicians in different ways. So yeah. the way that musicians interact with YouTube, for example, is very different from how people interact with Instagram which is very different from how people interact with TikTok. And I'm still fascinated by TikTok because TikTok is its own thing entirely and you can't approach it the same way that you can with Instagram. Um, Adam is on TikTok. I'm on TikTok. We've been on TikTok for a long time. I still don't. I don't understand it, but I still post there. It's It's, cool. It's it's fun. It's awesome, but I I can't do it. (laughs) I post there because then if I post there, my kids won't watch it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting to see how the cultures develop on each platform, right? Like, uh, you know, TikTok has this culture of uh, stitching, and that's a big thing yeah. with like a duetting. You know, it's yeah, a big duetting. thing with musicians. Is yeah. like, you know, a cat will make a funny sound, and then all of a sudden, there's a choir singing along with the cat. And I used to see people do that a little bit on Instagram, but it's really, yeah. really part of TikTok. Yeah, and that, part. that's so cool. That's it's so, really interesting. It's so it's so interesting, and it's own its own thing. It's like yeah. you can't you can't do it on other platforms. It's just what it is over there. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I can't say why Instagram is still the thing. So I posted this thing on yeah. YouTube Shorts the other day. Of, I. Has. I have a question for you, though. Yeah. Where do you see YouTube Shorts in this? Okay, so YouTube Shorts is a completely different platform. This is yeah. this is what I was going to say. So yeah. I I did an interview with the bass player from Nirvana, Chris, and, oh, yeah, yeah. and the Kim from, from Soundgarden, and Jack Andino, who produced a lot of the Seattle bands. And I posted a little clip of Chris talking about Kurt Cobain, and the guy said, oh, you should do a vid. Is there a video coming out with this? There's such a disconnect between, yeah, I put it out uh, eight months ago. There's such a disconnect between YouTube shorts mm. that people don't even realize. People that watch, that look at shorts on YouTube have no idea that I have an actual YouTube channel that has that these that this video is from that. I, I don't even know. No, I got together with him and I made a vertical video that's <laughs> that's 30 seconds long and that's the that's the extent of it. 
Yeah, it is pretty segmented. Um, I, I, it is its own thing. I, I, I don't know. I'm not really, I don't do anything with YouTube shorts. It's cool, but <laughs> that, that's wild though to say, that's super wild be like, um, I don't see like how people go back and forth between the platforms that I'm on. If you're scrolling on TikTok or if you're like scrolling on Instagram or whatever, you're not going to another platform to see the full interview. You're not doing that. It's like the way you interact with each platform is so siloed. It's like, I'm now on Instagram. I'm now on YouTube. You're one of the few, other than Rhett really, but I mean, I've done many videos with you. Yeah, I've done. Yeah. I mean, Rhett lives 20 minutes from me, so. That, so it's Whenever you're in New York, we, we're like, I feel like we, we figure out something to, to talk every, about. Yeah, yeah. Every, every time I'm in New York, Alan, uh, Adam and I make, make a video together. But the, if you're gonna look up someone's video, mm -hmm. Do you see? I just typed the person's name in the space bar. I never, yeah, yeah. even though I subscribe to channels, I never no, no. look at my subscriptions. No. I just don't. If I want to look at you, I just type, type in Adam. By AD, it just pops up <laughs> and your videos come up, and I look at your channel that way. But I don't know if many people do. Do you do that or no? Uh, I definitely do that. One thing that, I've, <laughs> thing that I've done is like if I want to, if I, <laughs> I did this recently. Uh, I forget what video it was, but I was just talking about the video I wanted to make like into my uh, phone's camera. Right. And then on, all of a sudden on the, uh, the recommended, yep. <laughs> it popped up. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, because every, it's always listening. So I just of like, course. I want to I wanna find, <laughs> I don't know, this uh, video. I was uh, watching a lot. There's this channel called Knowing Better. It's mm -hmm. like uh, social studies videos. It's, it's great. Uh, there's a video of his I really wanted to like watch. And so I just kept talking about like Christian science. Like I really like Christian science. Christian science is very interesting. Let me watch videos about Christian science. And then I open up YouTube. <laughs> and it's right there. I'm like, yes. <laughs> but I've been watching a lot of his videos before. So, you know. But I'm yeah. very fascinated by other YouTubers' viewing habits. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you watch a lot of TikTok? Do you watch Instagram? What do you watch the most of as far as short form, first of all? For short form, I guess TikTok. Okay. Um, I don't watch that much TikTok, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if I'm watching something, normally it's a little bit longer form yep. stuff. And, you know, I watch a lot of history videos on YouTube. Yep. A lot of, like, philosophy videos and, like, you know, like, a lot of... A lot of things that aren't necessarily related to music, and when Me I too. am when I'm watching music-related videos, it's almost like uh, watching friends' videos or watching like just seeing how somebody puts together a video. Like I do that all the time with Paul David's. Like I watch Paul David's videos because he's one of my friends, but it's also like ah, oh, this looks really this looks really good. I wanna, yeah, I want to copy this technique. <laughs> We all you know, we yeah. all are in, are influenced by each other. It's, yeah. it's it's fascinating that that we've all kept going on this platform for years. Inertia is a hell of a thing. You know, I've slowed down a lot, mm -hmm. and you know, you you keep churning them out. I have no idea how you do it. I mean, <laughs> you're doing all these amazing interviews, which I think is like the really exciting thing about uh, what you've done over the past couple of years. Like doing a Keith Jarrett interview is like incredible and like the Pat Metheny interview, uh, Brian May, like there's so many, you're going to be interviewing somebody else this afternoon. Yep. Not going to reveal that quite yet, <laughs> but it's very exciting. <laughs> um, like how do you, what is your thought on how, like what keeps you going? Because I, I'm doing it because it's still fun to me, but I've had to slow down because it wasn't as fun as much as it was maybe three or four years ago. So I, since I've shifted towards doing more interviews, I mean, I, I, I've done a lot of interviews in the last couple of years, and, um, but not, you know, it's only a portion of my content. But the interviews are fascinating because I get to talk to people uh, and I ask them things that only they know. So mm. my, my idea for the interview is ask things that only they could answer. Mm. Ron, what, Ron Carter, what was it like playing difference between playing with Tony Williams and Elvin Jones. Mm -hmm. Keith Jarrett, what's the difference between playing with Charlie Hayden or Gary Peacock? I mean, yeah. who can how many people can say that how do you play differently? Yeah. And one person can answer that really. Yeah. You that's know? super cool. So so and I get to ask people 
things that I've always wondered. And I ask the question and then I shut up. And that's my interview technique. Rick, you're a good interviewer. Yeah, I, because I ask a question and I listen. I mean, it seems like a, uh, it seems like a common, um, common thing. Well, the difference I feel like with how you interview is you have a deep knowledge of the music that you are talking about, but also you have a, a theoretical knowledge. So you're approaching the music as like a player, like somebody who, who has engaged with the music, um, not just a passive fan or passive consumer of music, but somebody who has actually played the music, who understands who teaches the music. And that's, I feel like, the difference between your style of interview and other people's styles of interview with musicians. Because often when I read them, like in magazines, for example, it's very surface level, or at least it's very, it doesn't get to the playing, the performance. It doesn't get to the composition. It doesn't get to the thought process behind the music the way that, you know, a player thinks about it. Like, like uh, in the Keith Jarrett interview, like ta- he was talking about uh, triads versus fourths. I was yeah. like, yes, perfect. That's exactly right? something I've been thinking about too. I'm like, that's great. That's yeah. awesome. And, you know, that's not an interview that somebody who hasn't engaged with the music. I mean, Keith Jarrett I don't, yeah. has never talked about what he played in interviews. It's so, yeah. It so, and it, and yeah. the funny thing was, so he played me this, this Eastman recording that somebody had sent to him that he did in 1976. He wrote this piece for Eastman's studio orchestra. Some people are thinking... How did Rick have this? Why was he playing this for Keith? He's like, no, Keith played it for me. I don't have the recording. But Keith, it's one of the few times that he actually plays fourths like McCoy. It's very funny that we, t- we talked about that and that he, and he loved Coltrane, that he, um, in that piece, was one of the very few times. And I said to him, the first time I went to, because I visited him twice over the course of two weeks. And the first time I didn't film, and I said, I said, yeah. You played a couple of fourth voicings on Stella by Starlight on one of those standards records, just in the bridge, like you know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, and he said, yeah, I didn't play a lot of fourths, probably because because everybody was doing that yeah, at the yeah. time. That was that was part of the vocabulary, and that was he he had a different language that he was, you know, talking about. One of the things that I did not actually ask Keith in the interview uh, was I in the that I asked him. Previously, I said, who's one person that you wish you'd played with that you didn't? He said, Wayne Shorter. Mm. This is before Wayne passed. Yeah. And I didn't ask that, didn't re-ask the question, unfortunately, in the interview, but... Um, yeah. Uh, you were mentioning ESP earlier. Um, yep. Since Wayne's, uh, Wayne Shorter's passing, you know, I've been going back and checking out a lot of these records, Speak No Evil, um, and th- that that is something that, like, I feel it's so important in the interviews is to try and capture like what a person is thinking about, because yeah. that's something that you can't just get from listening to the recording. You have to get, go straight to the person and finding that kind of, you know, um, there, there are plenty of interviews with Wayne Shorter. Um, and it's really beautiful to like watch him speak and, uh, you know, learn, learn from the, learn from the master themselves yes. themselves. And because they're not going to be around forever, too. Yeah. That's the other thing. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's something that's very cool about what you're doing on YouTube is at least capturing that, at least having that moment and sharing it. And that's something that, you know, if anything is going to be motivating me for the next 10 years on YouTube, hopefully I'm not making YouTube videos for 10 the next 10 years. <laughs> God. News. News flash. <laughs> But I don't. I, I think you will be. Uh, it's it's hopefully to capture like beautiful moments and share them with people, and hopefully, hopefully making YouTube videos will will be that, and that I think is the motivation more than anything else. Um, when I do live shows, the few live shows I've done, oh, yeah. I've done four or five. Um, but I talk about my favorite YouTube videos to watch are YouTubers that are quitting. I love. I love. You're free. <laughs> Those. I just enjoy those, and I always, I always hope that there's one <laughs> that one pops up. I'm like, yes, because I can't wait. It's not that I want people to quit. I just love to hear people talk about you. You see what, yourself in that, like you see so, like a deep connection to every time. Yes, everything it, that they talk about about making videos and what it's like, and and uh, the, mm-hmm. the pressure that the, a lot of it's a self-imposed pressure, though, right? It's, you don't have yeah. to do the, you don't yeah. have to do these. It, it's all self-imposed pressure, and like the the nature of the beast is that it 
it co it coerces you into <laughs> self-imposing, you know. Um, one, one of the most recent quitting videos that I've seen that I like. <laughs> um, so you like these oh, too? they're good. They're great. Um, Carlos Ini, uh, Insane in the Rain Music. He makes great, like, or used to make great jazz uh, video game covers. And he, okay. he made a I'm quitting video. Okay. But it was more, like, it was interesting because he set for himself, like, I'm quitting, but I'm just, I'm doing something else now. And okay. he's still making YouTube videos off and on, but it's not what he was making before. Okay. So he, he just stopped doing what he was doing before recalibrated and now he's doing a different thing altogether and i thought that was very interesting it was like okay i'm quitting but i'm not really quitting i've just completely changed my perspective on this platform and i was like oh that's great and he actually did it which is amazing most but, people say yeah. they're quitting just so they can get the bump of yeah. uh, of views and i i uh <clears throat> my, my daughter layla's like dan tdm's quitting that dan tdm is a youtuber that's that D done many Minecraft videos, mm. 3,200 or so, and, and uh, he's got 26 million followers. But my kids used to watch Dan TDM all the time. Yeah. He's, he's a British YouTuber, and he did a YouTuber quitting video recently, mm -hmm. but he had a question mark on it. Mm. He's he just had his second kid, and you know, it's 3,200 videos is. It's a lot. That's, that's a lot of videos. Lot of like videos. I thought I made a lot, and I'm at it over like 1,100 and something. But Jeez. but I watched his video and enjoyed it very much. And uh, so I don't just watch. It's not music YouTuber quitting, uh, quitting videos. It's every kind of quitting videos. But it's fast. It's just fascinating. To Musicians hear people don't make talk. They don't quitting videos. No. Yeah, they just like oh I'm not doing anything for like a year or so and. and then I'll come back and tour or something like that. But because of YouTube, it's like you have to be like constantly, constantly, constantly. Um, you know, you make quitting videos. Uh, actors don't make quitting videos. No. <laughs> they just <laughs> they don't. They just stop appearing in movies. For like a year or, whatever. or two. Yeah. And then like, oh, maybe I should do a video or a video <laughs> to a film again. <laughs> well, I said, in, I said in one of my videos recently where I talked about this that I won't make a quitting video. I'll just stop making videos one day. At, yeah. Um, it's like the Ben Affleck from Goodwill Hunting. Like every day, I wake up and I hope that I don't find you in the the house when I come by your house. And it happened. <laughs> That's right. Um, so may we all have our Goodwill Hunting ending on YouTube. <laughs> Will anyone remember us in eighty years, Adam? I don't know. And I think it's if uh, people teach us. I think if that's the case. I think if people teach us, or if people uh, continue on youtube of the of the 2000s it's Will going it's going to be a thing you think so i promise you i promise you <laughs> like every bit of culture now is fodder for some kind of historical understanding later i feel like um you know people are looking back at the early 2000s like the early aughts or the 90s and like teaching classes about that part in history so like why not now why not 2023 <laughs> well i i've been thinking about this lately that people die two deaths there's your death and then eventually all the people that knew you mm. are gone yeah. you know and um maybe that's another 80 years after you're gone this this is may, maybe all related you know mm. unless you're bach or beethoven or mozart or charlie parker whoever you're going to talk about and they the, might be forgotten too right because you know you think about people from the classical tradition like in the 1200s or the 1300s yeah. like uh Guillaume de Mouchot or like Periton or like all of these early Leonin Leonin yeah Walter von der Folgeweide <laughs> <laughs> like, all these people yeah. we learn in in music history and uh but history too yeah but they, but they aren't taught like as part of the popular That's culture right. so they're forgotten yeah um although Adam and I have not forgotten them no god <laughs> we gotta, we gotta bring the show back, guys. I, I'm telling you, give them a show. Mm, some good stuff there, but it's you know, it's it's whether or not the now continue. Now continues, you see, you know? see, Adam mentioned Palestrina earlier. Mm. Now, this is a thing. Even though we're jazz musicians by training, well, I'm a classical musician by training because my mm. I have a classical bass undergrad and then jazz guitar masters. Mm. All jazz musicians, though, if you go to music school, you study classical music. Yeah, you get you get you get a taste. It's yeah. not the main focus, but you do get a taste of at least the the lineage, the tradition. Because you know, quite frankly, uh, 
Duke Ellington was checking out like Ravel and right. like you know Charlie Parker was checking out Stravinsky. There's the classic. You're talking about people from the late uh, 1800s, 1890s, and yeah. there's a couple of musicians there, Ravel and yeah, that, that were alive during that period that composed into the into the early 20th century. And, and then there and there <clears throat> and then their influence is furthered by people like Duke Ellington and then whoever he influences. Like uh, Stravinsky wrote for Benny Goodman, Mm -hmm. like the Ebony Concerto. Like there was some crossover between like European classical music and jazz in the early 20th century that was very, very like they influenced each other in a way. And so jazz musicians now will often like study uh, classical as part of the tradition. It's not the tradition, but it's part of it. Um, I've noticed that classical musicians don't do the same for no. the jazz canon, which is mm, no, I'm not, not cool. No, I'm not. I'm not sure if I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So we'll put that out there as a challenge to you, classical musicians, <laughs> to to actually become familiar with uh, with some of the historical jazz figures. That 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 go, might be a good thing. Go check out uh, Rick's video, his great interview with Keith Jarrett, because he is an important part of that canon. And uh, yeah. Go check out all of Adam's videos and subscribe to his channel. Adam, thank you so much for being my guest today. Thanks for uh, having me me here. Always love having you. (laughs) That was great. What the hell is that video about? (laughs) Well, they set the cameras.